Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, January 14th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Well, we got nothing fundamentally new today about the Citrix ADC vulnerability. DDA earlier today summarized some of the payloads we have seen in a diary, but it's pretty much the standard stuff, crypto coin miners, some probing and the occasional backdoor. But if you think that, well, since you made it past uh, this Citrix issue, that now it's time to relax a little bit and sit back, well, you picked the wrong profession. Turns out that tomorrow we may have a quite interesting Microsoft Patch Tuesday coming up. It has been leaked that one of the updates that will be released by Microsoft tomorrow will patch a flaw in crypt32.dll. Now, this is the basic cryptography and certificate handling library in Microsoft's operating systems, also known as Crypto API, and does provide a number of critical functions, including validation of digital signatures. So what's assumed here is that due to this flaw, it's possible to essentially trick uh, the crypto API into accepting an invalid signature as valid. Brian Krebs summarized uh, what he was able to learn about this vulnerability. And apparently this vulnerability was used in exploits targeting some government agencies who then reported the vulnerability to Microsoft. And due to this being already actively being exploited and being reported by these government agencies, Microsoft told them about this upcoming patch ahead of time and may also have provided them with a pre-release version. And apparently that's sort of where some of the secrecy around this pre-release failed. Now, what's not quite clear yet is what the possible impact will be of this vulnerability. So it could, for example, be used to create an invalid certificate and with that spoof websites more convincingly or it could be used to create signatures for code that makes it appear like it's, for example, a valid code created by Microsoft. The second scenario, of course, could become quite a big problem because a lot of endpoint protection solutions exempt uh, software that's signed by a trusted uh, entity like Microsoft from inspection and implicitly trust this software. So uh, this could uh, really sort of bypass a lot of the endpoint protection systems that uh, people sort of have become accustomed to. Also, some things like the Microsoft Safer co configuration, for example, could be affected by this, but we really don't know yet. And we really have to wait for the bulletin tomorrow to give us more detail to really accurately judge what the impact will be of this vulnerability. But everything points at this point to a vulnerability that you probably want to patch very expeditiously, probably this week if you can pull this off. Of course, we also don't know yet how this particular vulnerability is going to be exploited and how difficult it will be to create a bad signature, for example. However, in the past, a lot of times, all it took was some padding and such, and this may be one of those vulnerabilities where once you see how it works, it's actually not that terrible difficult to pull off. And researchers at Princeton University did an interesting experiment where they looked into how difficult it is to pull off the SIM swap attack against five different US-based carriers. Now, what they did essentially, they just called the carrier, tried to get their SIM card swapped on a phone number they owned, but on purpose did get some of the authentication steps wrong. Now, all of the carriers have as an option that they'll send you an SMS message with a PIN number, which of course 
requires that you do have the old SIM card available and all but one allow you to set up a pin with the carrier that is used to authenticate you. So what they essentially did is they said they forgot the pin number or they no longer had the phone so they were not able to retrieve that SMS number which then of course kicks in sort of recovery procedure. The customer service rep doesn't just want you to go away essentially and so they usually have some backup procedures in case you cannot use this primary authentication method and that's where things essentially went wrong. For example, often it's just the last phone numbers that you called that are being requested. Well, that could be someone that you call very often that an adversary knows that you call them or the adversary could have tricked you into calling a specific number or simple things like personal information like your address and email address and the like. In essence, all carriers uh, could be convinced to swap a SIM card without much difficulty, which again reaffirms that SMS messages are no good for any serious second factor authentication. And many times before I talked about uh, NPM security and how well it's not really there where it should be in particular when it comes uh, to identifying, authenticating authors of various NPM packages and the entire process of publishing these NPM packages. And of course, there have been multiple instances of uh, developers losing credentials and then others being able to publish packages in their name. Well, uh, Google released a tool that will hopefully help with that. Google open sourced an internal tool that I have been using called Wombat Dressing Room. What it is essentially an NPM publication proxy. So it doesn't require that you change uh, what you're doing at this point, but it allows you to authenticate, for example, using two-factor authentication and uh, this proxy essentially will sort of take care of it for you so your automation tools will still work. Interesting approach and I've had not a chance of course to play with this tool yet but if you're heavily using NPM you probably should take a look at this tool. Well and this is it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.